أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا السرات المستقيم سرات الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful Dr. William Campbell, Dr. Zake Naik, Dr. Mazakus, Dr. Jamal Badawi, Dr. Samuel Nauman, and Mr. Sam Shamoon. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace and blessings of Almighty Allah be upon all of you. On behalf of the organizers, the Islamic Circle of North America, I, Sayyid Sabil Ahmed, welcome all of you to this unique event, a dialogue on the topic, the Quran, the Bible, in the light of science. Again, on behalf of Dr. Campbell, Dr. Zakir Naik, Islamic Circle of North America, this dialogue is being held in a spirit of friendship, understanding each other's viewpoints. A brief introduction of ICNA's activities, Islamic Circle of North America. The goals of Islamic Circle of North America are to motivate Muslims to perform their duty of being witnesses unto mankind, offering educational training opportunities to increase the Islamic knowledge and to enhance the character. ICNA is also active in opposing immorality and oppression of all forms, supporting efforts for socioeconomic justice, civil liberties in the society, strengthening the bond of humanity by serving all those in need anywhere in the world, with special focus on our neighborhood across North America. For today's unique dialogue, the two main moderators are Dr. Muhammad Naik, representing Dr. Zakir Naik, and Dr. Samuel Nauman, representing Dr. William Campbell. It is my duty to ensure a fair and proper conduct of this meeting. Therefore, we request our speakers, as well as the audience, to maintain due decorum for a healthy dialogue. With that, I would request Dr. Samuel Nauman to give the introduction of Dr. William Campbell. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Brother Sabil Ahmed. It's a pleasure and honor to be here with you this evening. And uh, first of all, I myself, with a group of our uh, brothers and sisters from the Christian background, really like to thank the Islamic Circle of North America and uh, the local people who have organized this unique event. They have done a great job. They have worked very hard. 
and now we have come to the last moment to be here. Dr. William Campbell did his medical work in Cleveland, Ohio at Case Western U Reserve University. He worked for 20 years in Morocco where he learned Arabic. After seven years in Tunisia, he wrote his book, Answering Dr. Maurice Bukhais. He is a convinced Christian who likes to explain the Injil or the Gospel to everyone. At age 74, Dr. Campbell is retired with 10 grandchildren. And we are really thankful and we are really happy to be here with you tonight. Thank you. On behalf of the Islamic Research Foundation, I, Dr. Muhammad Naik, am pleased to be amongst you all along with Dr. Zakir. It's a pleasure to be here for this unique event and have the good pleasure of having scholars like Dr. William Campbell, Dr. Jamal Badawi, Dr. Mazakas, as well as my co-colleague, brother Dr. Samuel Naman, you're with us. I, on behalf of brother Samuel and myself, present the format for the dialogue. The format as agreed and decided fair by both our speakers is, Dr. William Campbell would first address you for 55 minutes on the topic, the Quran and the Bible in the light of science. Then Dr. Zakir Naik at the far end would make his presentation for 55 minutes on the same topic. This would be followed by a response session in which Dr. Campbell would respond to the matter presented by Dr. Zakir for 25 minutes, followed by Dr. Zakir too responding for 25 minutes to the matter presented by Dr. Campbell. Lastly, we would have the open question and answer session in which the audience may pose questions to each speaker alternately on the question mics provided in the auditorium. After the mics, questions are handled. We would allow questions on index cards to be provided by volunteers in the aisles and in the order selected at random by the coordinators and the advisors to each of the speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, to address you today, Dr. William Campbell. Greeting to Dr. Nike, who came, almost surely came the farthest. Greeting to Sabil Ahmed and Mohammed Naik. And greeting to the organizing committee. Calling this the ultimate dialogue is a bit of an exaggeration, but it is good advertising. And greetings to you, the audience. I'd like to also bring greetings in the name of Yahweh, or better known as Jehovah, the great creator God who loves us. I wish to start by speaking about words. Tonight we are going to speak about the words of the Bible and the words of the Koran. The scholars of modern linguistics tell us a word, a phrase, or a sentence means what it meant to the speaker and the person or crowd of people listening. In the case of the Koran, what it meant to Mohammed and the, those listening to him. In the case of the Bible, what it meant to Moses or Jesus, or those listening to them. To check this, we have the context of all the usages in the Bible or the Koran. In addition, there is the poetry and letters of that century. For the Gospel, the first century AD. For the Koran, the first century of the Hejra. If we are going to follow the truth, we may not make up new meanings. If we are seriously after truth, there are no permissible lies. Here is an example of what I am talking about. You can have the first slide here.
This is talking about two dictionaries that I have in my home, one from 1951 and 1991. In these two dictionaries, the first meaning, pig, a young swine of either sex, is the same. The second meaning, any swine or hog, any wild or domestic swine, it's the same. Third, the flesh of swine, pork, is the same. Then the, the meaning, a person or animal of piggish habits, it's the same. A person who is gluttonous. And down here, pouring metal into a pig for pig iron is the same. But over here is a new meaning, a police officer. You need to call the police officers pigs. All right, the question is, in the Torah, it says you can't eat pigs. Well, can I turn around and say, oh, yes, that means police officers. You can't eat police officers. Of course not. In the Koran, Allah says can't eat pigs. Can I translate it, can't eat put police officers? No. It's wrong. It would be stupid. It would be lying, actually. Mohammed did not mean police officers. Moses did not mean police officers. We may not have any new meanings. We must use the meanings known in the first century AD for the Bible, or that is for the Gospel, and the first century of the Hejra for the Koran. Now let us look at what the Koran is going, says about embryology. Oh, sorry, got the wrong thing. It has been said that the idea of the embryo developing through stages is a modern one, and that the Koran is anticipating modern embryology by depicting differing stages. In a pamphlet entitled Highlights of Human Embryology by Keith Moore, Dr. Moore claims the realization that the embryo develops in stages in the uterus was not discussed or illustrated until the 15th century. We will weigh this claim by considering the meaning of the Arabic words used by the Koran, and secondly, by examining the historical situation leading up to and surrounding the Koran. We will start by looking at the main words using the word alaka, main verses. The Arabic word alaka in the singular, or alak as the collective plural, is used six times. In the Surah of the Resurrection, al qiyamah 75, 35 to 39, we read, was he man, not a drop of sperm ejaculated? Then he became alaka, and God shaped and formed and made of him a pair, the male and the female. In the Surah of the Believer, al mumin 4067, it says, he it is who created you from dust, then from a sperm drop, then from a leech-like clot, alaka, then brings you forth as a child that perhaps you may understand. In the Surah of the Pilgrimage, Al-Hajj 22.5, it says, O mankind, if you have doubt about the resurrection, consider that we have created you from dust, then from a drop of seed, then from a clot, alaka, then from a little lump of flesh, shapely and shapeless. And finally, the fullest treatment is in the Surah of the Believers, Al-Mu'minun 23.12-14, which reads, Verily, we created man from a product of wet earth, then placed him as a drop of seed in a safe lodging. Then we fashioned the drop of clot, alaka, and of the clot we fashioned a lump, and of the lump we fashioned bones, and we clothed the bones with meat. Then we produced it as another creation. And here you have the stages according to the Koran. Nutfa sperm, alaka clot, Mudaga, piece of meat. Adam, bones. And the fifth stage, dressing the bones with muscles. Over the last hundred plus years, this word alaka has been translated as follows. There's 10 translations here. I'm not going to read them all. Three are in French, where it says un gomo de sang, or a clot of blood. Three versions, five versions are English, where it's either clot or leech-like clot. One version is in Indonesian, at the bottom there, sigampal dara, lump of or clot of blood. And the last one is Farsi, khun basta, a clot of blood. As every reader who has studied human reproduction will realize, 
There is no stage as a clot during the formation of a fetus. So this, so this is a very major scientific problem. In the dictionaries of Wur and Abdenur, the only meanings given for alaka in this sem feminine singular are clot and leech. And in North Africa, both of these meanings are still used. Many patients have come to me to ask for a clot to be removed from their throat. And many women have come to me and told me their period didn't come. When I say, I'm sorry, I can't give you medicine to bring your period because I believe that's a baby, they would say, Mazel Dim, it's still blood. So they were understanding these ideas of the Quran. Lastly, we must consider the first verses which came to Muhammad in Mecca. These are found in the 96th surah called Alaq, clots, from the very word that we're studying. In 96.1.2, we read, proclaim, in the name of your Lord who created, created man from Alaq. Here the word is in the collective plural. This form of the word can have other meanings because alak is also the derived verbal noun of the verb alika. The verbal noun usually corresponds to the gerund in English, as in the sentence, swimming is fun. Therefore, we could expect it to mean hanging or clinging or adhering. But the 10 translators listed above have all used clot or congealed blood in this verse too. In spite of the number and qualifications of these translators who use the word clot, the French doctor Maurice Bucay has sharp words for them. He writes, what is more likely to mislead the inquiring reader is once again the problem of vocabulary. The majority of translations describe, for example, man's formation from a blood clot. A statement of this kind is totally unacceptable to scientists specializing in the field. This shows how great the importance of an association between linguistic and scientific knowledge is when it comes to grasping the meaning of Quranic statements on reproduction. Put in other words, Bukai is saying, nobody has translated the Quran correctly until I, Dr. Bukai, came along. How does Dr. Bukai think that it should be translated? He proposes that instead of clot, the word alaka should be translated as something which clings which would refer to the fetus being attached to the uterus through the placenta. But as all you ladies who've been pregnant know, the thing which clings doesn't stop its clinging to become chewed meat. It keeps on being the thing which clings, which is attached by the placenta for eight and a half months. Thirdly, these verses say that the chewed meat becomes bones, and then the bones are covered with muscle. They give the impression that first the skeleton is formed, and then it is closed with flesh, and Dr. Bukai knows perfectly well that this is not true. The muscles and the cartilage precursors of the bones start forming from the somite at the same time. At the end of the eighth week, there are only a few centers of ossification started, but the fetus is already able to make muscular movement. In a personal letter from Dr. T.W. Sadler, who's associate professor in, embryo in anatomy, and the author of Langman's Medical Embryology, Dr. Stad Sadler states, at the eighth week post-fertilization, the ribs would be cartilaginous, not bone, and muscles would be present. Also at this time, ossification would just begin. Muscles would be capable of some movement at eight weeks. It's always better to have two witnesses so we shall see what Dr. Keith Moore has to say about the development of bones and muscles in his book, The De Developing Human. Extracted from chapters 15 and 17, we find the following information. The skeletal, skeletal system develops from mesoderm. The limb muscles develop in the limb buds that are derived from this somatic mesoderm. We see that here on this slide. It's difficult perhaps to see, but there's the limb bud. And then here there's just a little bit of cartilage with the muscles around. Here there's more cartilage. And this is the whole, the bones are formed and in the form of bones, but it's all cartilage, no bones yet. This second slide shows how it forms. Here's a, Here's the cartilage, you know, just the bone is, looks like cart cartilage. And then it starts to have some calcium deposited. 
and then it starts to have ossification and bone form. As the bone models form, sorry. I want to go back to this. As the bone models form, myoblasts develop a large muscle mass in each limb bud, separating into extensor and flexor muscles. In other words, the limb muscles develop simultaneously from the mesenchyme surrounding the developing bones. So there's the cartilage, and here are the muscles developing around the cartilage. During a personal conversation with Dr. Moore, I showed him Dr. Sadler's statement, and he agreed that it was absolutely valid. Conclusion, Dr. Sadler and Dr. Moore agree. There is no time when calcified bones have been formed and then the muscles are placed around them. The muscles are there several weeks before there are calcified bones, rather than being added around previously formed bones as the Koran states. The Koran is in complete error here. The problems are far from being solved. Let us fully return to Alaka. Dr. Moore also has a suggestion. He says another verse in the Quran refers to the leech-like appearance and the chewed-like stages of human development. From this definition, Dr. Moore has gone ahead to propose that a 23-day 23 23-day embryo, three millimeters long, that's an eighth of an inch, I can hardly put my fingers that close together without touching. This is Carnegie stage 10 shown on the inside cover of Moore's book. This is the beginning, and here's the sperm entering the egg. So that's stage one. Comes down here to stage six in the second week. And here is the third week. And there, it's, there's stage 10, and here is day 23. And this is what Dr. Moore wants to say looks like a leech. If we look further, though, and look at the x-ray, here's day 22, and the bone, backbone is still open. And when we look at day 23, the backbone is open there, and it's open there, and the head is wide open. It doesn't look like a leech at all. And if you keep on, and this, this is a diagram of it. The head is open, the rostral neuropore. And finally, this diagram shows there's the, there is the the 20-day embryo, it's got a yolk sac, it's got an umbilicus, it doesn't look like a leech at all. The problem, the great problem with these new definitions for the word alaka is that no confirming examples have been provided from the Arab, Arabic use in the centuries surrounding the Hejra. The only way to establish the meaning of the word is by usage. The only way to establish whether the singular form alaka can mean a three millimeter embryo or the thing that clings is to bring sentences demonstrating this usage from the literature of the Arabs of Mecca and Medina close to the time of Mohammed, especially from the language of the Quraysh. This will not be an easy task because much work has already been done on the clear Arabic of the Quraysh. The early Muslims understood intuitively the need to know exactly what the Quranic words mean. And for this reason, they made comprehensive studies of their language and poetry. Hamza Boubacar, former rector of the main mosque in Paris, brought up this subject at a conference on the One God in Montpellier in 1985. He posed the question to the audience, has the comprehension of the text of the Quran known at the time of Mohammed remained stable? And his answer was, ancient poetry shows that it has. We can only, only conclude, if the verses which bring spiritual comfort and hope to Muslims have remained stable, then the scientific statements embedded in those verses must also be accepted as stable, unless new evidence can be brought forward. This is especially important since some of the verses say that this information is a sign. The Surah of the Believer, as we saw above, says he, is, he it is who created you from dust, then from a sperm drop, then from a clot, alaka, that perhaps you may understand. And in the Surah of the Pilgrimage, he said, O oh mankind, if you have doubt about the resurrection, consider. Therefore, the question must be asked. asked 
If it was a clear sign to the men and women of Mecca and Medina, what did they understand from the word alaka, which would lead them to faith in the resurrection? The answer, we are going to examine the historical situation leading up to the time of Mohammed to see what Mohammed and his people believed about embryology. We will start with Hippocrates. According to the best evidence, he was born on the Greek island of Kos in 460 BC. And he has stages. His stages are as follows. The sperm is a product which comes from the whole body of each parent. Weak sperm coming from the weak parts and strong sperm from the strong parts. Then he goes ahead and talks about the coagulation of the mother's blood. The seed embryo then is contained in a membrane. Moreover, it grows because of its mother's blood, which descends to the womb. For once a woman conceives, she ceases to menstruate. Then about flesh, he says, at this stage, with the descent and coagulation of the mother's blood, flesh begins to form, with the, be formed with the umbilicus. And lastly, bones, he says, as the flesh grows, it is formed into distinct members by breath. The bones grow hard like a, and send out branches like a tree. Next, we will look at Aristotle. In his book on the generation of animals, sometime about 350 BC, he gives his stages of embryology. And he talks about first semen and menstrual blood, or catamenia. In this section, Aristotle speaks of the male semen as being in a pure state. It follows that what the female would contribute to the semen of the male would be material for the semen to work on. In other words, the semen clots the menstrual blood. Then he goes to the flesh. He says, nature forms this from the purest material, the flesh and from the residue thereof it forms bones. And lastly, around the flesh, around the bones, and attached to them by thin fibrous bands, grow the fleshly parts. Clearly, the Koran follows this exactly. Sperm clotting the menstrual flood, which forms meat, then the bones are formed, and lastly, around about the bones, grow the fleshly parts. Next, we will consider Indian medicine. The, in, the opinion of Sharaka in 123 AD and Susruta is that both the male and female contributed seed. The secretion of the male is called the sukra, semen. The secretion of the woman is called artava, or sanita, blood. And it is derived from the blood by way of food, by way of blood. Here we see that in the medicine of India, they too had the idea that the child was formed from semen and blood. Now we shall look at Galen. Galen was born in 131 AD in Pergamum, modern Bergama in Turkey. Galen says on semen, the substance from which the fetus is formed is not merely menstrual blood, as Aristotle maintained, but menstrual blood plus the two semens. The Koran agrees with Galen here when it says in Surah 76.2, we created man from a drop of mingled sperm. Now we'll look at the Galen stages. Galen also taught that the embryo developed in stages. The first is that in which the form of the semen prevails. The next stage is when it has been filled with blood. And heart and brain and liver are still unarticulated and unshaped. This is the period that Hippocrates called fetus. The Quranic Surah 22.5 reflects this saying then out of a morsel of flesh partly formed and partly unformed. And now the third period of gestation has come. This, thus it, it, nature, caused flesh to grow on and around all the bones. We saw above that the Koran agrees with this in Surah 23, 14, where it says, and we clothe the bones with meat. The fourth and final period Sorry, the fourth and final period is at the stage when all the parts of the, in the limbs have been differentiated. Galen was so important in medicine that just about the time of the Hejra, 
Four leading medical men in Alexandria, Egypt, decided to form a medical school using 16 books of Galen as the basis of the studies. This considered, continued up to and including the 13th century. We must now ask ourselves, what was the political, economic, and medical situation in Arabia at the time of Mohammed? From the Hadramaut in Yemen, the caravans of the spice trade passed north through Mecca and Medina and then reached into all of Europe. In North Arabia, in about 500 AD, the Ghassanids took over, and by 528, they controlled the Syrian desert over to the outskirts of Medina. Syriac, a form of Aramaic related to Arabic, was their official language. As early as 463, the Jews translated the Torah and Old Testament from Hebrew into Syriac. The British Museum has a copy. This made it available to the Ghassan, who were Christians, and to the Jewish tribes in Arabia. During this time, Sergius el Rasaini, who died in Constantinople in 536, one of the earliest and greatest translators from Greek into Syriac, translated various works on medicine, including 26 works of Galen. This made them available in the kingdom of Khosru I in Persia and to the Ghassan tribe whose influence extended to the outskirts of Medina. Khosru I, Arabic Kisra, king of Persia, was known as Khosru the Great. His troops conquered areas as far away as Yemen, and he also loved learning and started several schools. The school of Jundishapur became, during Khosru I's long reign of 48 years, the greatest intellectual center of the time. Within its walls, Greek, Jewish, Nestorian, Persian, and Hindu thought and experience were freely exchanged. Teaching was done largely in Syriac, from Syriac translations of Greek texts. This meant that Aristotle, Hippocrates, and Galen were readily available when the medical school at Jundishapur was operating during his reign. The next step was that the conquering Arabs compelled the Nestorians to translate their Syriac texts of Greek medicine into Arabic. The translation from Syriac to Arabic was easy, as the two languages had the same grammar. Concerning the local medical situation during Muhammad's life, we know there were physicians living in Arabia during this period. Harith ben Kalada was the best educated physician trained in the healing arts. He was born about the middle of the 6th century at Taif, in the tribe of Bani Thaqif. He traveled through Yemen and then Persia, where he received his education in the medical sciences at the great medical school of Jundi Shapur, and thus was intimately acquainted with the medical teachings of Aristotle, Hippocrates, and Galen. Having completed his studies, he practiced as a physician in Persia. And during this time, he was called to the court of King Khosru, with whom he had a long conversation. He came back to Arabia about the beginning of Islam and settled down at Taif. While there, Abu al-Khair, a king of Yemen, came to see him in connection with a certain disease, and on being cured, rewarded him with much money and a slave girl. Though Harith bin Kalada did not write any book on medicine, his views on many medical problems are preserved in his conversation with Khosru. About the eye, he says that it is constituted of fat, which is the white part. About the, which, and then the second is constituted with water, which is the black part, and of wind, which constitutes the eyesight. Well, these things we know to be wrong now, but this was Greek thought. All this goes to show the acquaintance of Harith with the Greek doctors. Summarizing the situation in a few words in his book, Histoire de la Médecine Arabe, Dr. Lucien Leclerc writes, Harith ben Kalada studied medicine at Jandi Shapur, and Muhammad owed to Harith a part of his medical knowledge. Thus with, with the, thus, with the one as well as the other, we easily recognize the traces of Greek medicine. Sometimes Muhammad treated the sick, but in the difficult cases, he would send the patients to Harith. Another educated man, person around Muhammad was Nader ben Harith. Not related to the doctor, he was a Karashite and cousin of Muhammad, and had also visited the court of Khosru. He had learned Persian and music, which he introduced among the Quraysh at Mecca. 
However, he was not sympathetic to Muhammad, mocking some of the stories in the Quran. Muhammad never forgave him for this, and when he was taken prisoner at the Battle of Badr, he caused him to, to be put to death. In summary, we see that one, Arabs living in Mecca and Medina in 600 had political and economic relations with people from Ethiopia, Yemen, Persia, and Byzantine. A cousin of Muhammad knew Persian well enough to do his musical studies in it. Three, the Hassan tribe which ruled the Syrian desert over to the gates of Medina used Syriac, one of the main languages used to teach medicine in Jundi Shapur as their official language. An ill king of Yemen came to Taif to consult the physician Harith ben Kalada, who had been trained where? At Jundi Shapur, the best medical school in that world, and to whom Muhammad sometimes sent patients. Five, during Muhammad's lifetime, a new medical school was established in Alexandria, using the 16 books of Galen as their texts. This all shows that there was ample opportunity for Muhammad and the people around him to have heard of the embryological theories of Aristotle, Hippocrates, and Galen when they went to seek treatment from Harith ben Kalada and other local doctors. Thus, when the Quran says in the late Meccan Surah of the Believer, 4067, he it is who created you from dust, then from a sperm drop, then from a leech-like clot, that perhaps you may understand. And then in the Surah of the Pilgrimage, O mankind, if you have doubt about the resurrection, consider what we have created, that we have created you from dust. It is correct for us to ask again, what were they to understand? What were they to consider? And here are the Quranic stages again. Nutfa sperm, alaka clot, mudaga piece of meat, adam bones, and five, dressing the bones with muscles. The answer is very clear. They were understanding and considering that which was common knowledge, the embryological stages as taught by the Greek physicians. I don't mean that Mohammed's listeners all knew the names of the Greek physicians, but they knew the embryological stages of the Greek physicians. They believed that the male sperm mixed with the female menstrual blood to cause it to clot, and this, be this became the baby. Two, they believed there was a time when the fetus was formed and unformed. Three, they believed the bones formed first and then were covered with muscle. Allah was using that common knowledge as a sign encouraging the listeners and readers to turn to him. The trouble is that this common knowledge was and is not true. Arab physicians after Muhammad. We must now look at two well-known physicians from the period after Muhammad. Obviously, they had no effect on the Quran, but they demonstrated that faith in the embryological ideas of Aristotle, Hippocrates, and Galen continued among the Arabs right up to the 1600s. If the correct translation of alaka is leech-like substance, as modern Muslims like Shabir Ali claim, there is no place where these post-Quranic doctors said so. In fact, it's just the opposite. The ideas of these Greek physicians were being used to explain the Koran, and the Koran was quoted to enlighten the meaning of the Greek physicians. The human being takes its origin from two, this is speaking about Ibn Asina or Avicenna. The human being takes its origin from two things, the male sperm, which plays the part of factor, the female sperm, first part of the menstrual blood, which provides the matter. Thus, we see that Ibn Sina gave the female semen exactly the same role that Aristotle had assigned to the menstrual blood. It is difficult to overstate the importance of Ibn Sina as a scientific and philosophical authority for the pre-modern Europeans. Then we're going to look at Ibn Qayyim al jawziyah Ibn Qayyim took full advantage of the agreement between Quranic revelation and Greek medicine. This is not very clear, probably, but the Hippocrates is in purplish, and the Quran is in bold type, green, and the Hadith is in purple, and commentaries are in red, and his own thoughts in sort of a blue-green. So it starts out, he's Giving, he says, Hippocrates said in the third chapter of Kitab al Ajinna, the semen is contained in a membrane and it grows because of the blood of its mother which descends to the womb. 
Some membranes are formed at the beginning, others after the second month, and others in the third month. And this spray is about the blood descending to the womb. We saw it when we looked at Hippocrates' slide. That is why God said, here the Koran is mentioned, he creates you in the womb of your mothers by one formation after another in three darknesses. That's Koran 39.6. Then he gives his own ideas. Since each of these membranes has its own darkness, when God mentioned the stages of creation and transformation from one state to another, he also mentioned the darknesses of the membranes. Most commentators explain, and here are the words of the commentators. It is the darkness of the belly and the darkness of the womb and the darkness of the placenta. In a second example, we read, Hippocrates said, the mouth opens up spontaneously and the nose and ears are formed from the flesh. The ears are opened and the eyes which are filled with a clear liquid. The prophet used to say, I worship him who made my face and formed it and opened my hearing and I say, and so forth. Here we look at Hippocrates again. And there in the second stage is the same thing we just read. Ibn al-Qayyim is quoting Hippocrates and speaks of the mother's blood descends around the membrane. He could do this, as we have seen, because the educated people of Muhammad's time were familiar with Greek medicine. However, what is important for us here today to realize is that there is no place where the Koran corrected Greek medicine. There is no place where Ibn Qayyim was shouting, hey, you guys, you've got it this all wrong. The correct meaning of alaka is that which clings or leech-like substance. On the contrary, Ibn Qayyim was demonstrating the agreement between the Koran and the Greek medicine, their agreement in error. A final witness is the commentary of Baydawi in 1200 AD. Here we have the commentary, we have the, 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 we have the Koran here, we have his, his commentary, and here it's been translated, and he says, then from Alaka, a piece of solid blood is his explanation of Alaka. Alaka is underlined, that's from the Koran. And here's his explanation, a piece of solid blood. Then he goes on, then from a piece of meat from the Koran. A piece of meat originally as much as can be chewed, and so forth. As I mentioned at the beginning of this study, it has been said that the idea of the embryo developing through stages is a modern one, and that the Koran is anticipating modern embryology by depicting differing stages. Yet we have seen that Aristotle, Hippocrates, the Indians, and Galen have all discussed the stages of embryological development during the thousand years before the Koran. And after the coming of the Koran, the account of the different stages as described by the Koran and the Greek doctors, was carried on in the teachings of Avicenna and even Qayyim, and is essentially the same as that taught by Galen and those preceding him. Concerning, concerning the bone stage, it's clear, as Dr. Moore demonstrated so capably in his textbook, that muscles start forming from the somites at the same time as the cartilage models of the bones. There's no bone stage where there's a skeleton sitting here and then and then the, the, the muscles are plastered around it. It is equally clear that alaka in the Koran means clot, and that the Koraish who heard Muhammad speaking understood him to be referring to the menstrual blood as the female contribution to the developing baby. Therefore, we can conclude that during all these years, the Quranic verses on embryology, saying that man is created from a drop of sperm which becomes a clot, were in perfect accord with the science of the first century of the Hejra, of the time of the Koran. But when compared with the modern science of the 20th century, Hippocrates is in error, Aristotle is in error, Galen is in error, and the Carol Koran is in error. They are all in serious error. Now we're going to look at a little bit about moonlight. Does the Koran state that the moon gives off reflected light from the sun? Before this was common knowledge. In the Surah of Noah, 71, 15, 16, it says, 
See ye not how Allah has created the seven heavens one above another, and made the moon a light, nur in their midst, and made the sun as a lamp, siraj? The moon is called a light, Arabic nur, and the sun a lamp, siraj. Some Muslims claim that since the Quran uses different words speaking from about the light of the sun and the light of the moon, it reveals that the sun is a source of light, while the moon only reflects light. This claim is implied very strongly by Shabir Ali in his booklet, Science in the Quran, and stated clearly by Dr. Zakir Naik in his video, is the Quran God's word, as you will now see clearly. The light that we have, the light that we obtain from the moon, where does it come from? So he will tell me that previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. But today, after science has advanced, we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it's a reflected light of the sun. I will ask him a question that it is mentioned in this Qur'an, in Surah Al-Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, Blessed is he who has created the constellation and placed therein a lamp and a moon which has reflected light. The Arabic word for moon is Qamar, and the light described there is Munir, which is borrowed light, or Nur, which is a reflection of light. The Qur'an mentions that the light of the moon is reflected light. You say you discovered it today. How come it's mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago? He will pause for a time. He won't reply immediately. And then may say, maybe, maybe it's a fluke. I don't argue with him. For sake. Near the end of the video, we heard Dr. Naik explain the Arabic word for moon is Qamar. And the light described there is Munir, which is borrowed light, or Nur, which is a reflection of light. Please do not forget what he said. Munir is borrowed light, and Nur is reflected light. Not only is this claimed to be a statement in keeping with scientific truth, but it is also claimed to be scientifically miraculous, since this was supposedly only discovered relatively recently. It is correct that the moon does not emit its own light, but only reflects the light of the sun. But this was known already almost a 1,000 years before Muhammad. Aristotle, in about 360 BC, discussed knowing that the Earth was round by its shadow on the moon. He could only speak of the Earth's shadow crossing the moon if he knew that moonlight is reflected light. If you still insist that this is a miracle of scientific knowledge, then we must ask ourselves, do the Quranic words themselves support this claim? Siraj. First, we shall look at Siraj. In Surah Noah, which was read above, in Surah Al-Furqan 2561, it is simply lamp, referring to the sun. In Surah Naba 7813, Sirajan Wahjan means a dazzling lamp, again indicating the sun. The words Nur and Munir come from the same Arabic word, root. The word Munir is used six times in the Quran. Four times, Surahs al Imran 3184, Al Hajj 228, Lukman 3120, and Fatir 3535, it is the phrase Kitab al Munir, which Yusuf Ali translates as a book of enlightenment, and P Piktal uses the scripture giving light. Clearly, this indicates a book which is radiating the light of knowledge. Nothing about reflection. Nur. It says in Surah Noah 7116 and Yunus 10.5 that Allah made the light, the moon a light. Thus we find that the Quran says that the moon is a light, and it never says that the moon reflects light. Moreover, in other verses, the Quran says that Allah is a nur, a light. Surah Nur 2435, one of the most beautiful passages in the Quran reads. Allah is the light 
nor of the heavens and the earth. The parable of his light is as if there was a niche, a niche, and within it a lamp, the lamp enclosed in glass, the glass as it were a brilliant star, and so forth. Thus we see that the word nur is used for both the moon and Allah. Are we going to say that Allah gives off reflected light? I think not. But if you continue to insist that nur used for the moon means borrowed or reflected light, and we saw above that Allah is the light nur of the heavens and the earth, what is the source of this light? Siraj, of which Allah is only a reflection. Think about it. If Allah is named nur or reflected light, who or what is the Siraj? Well, the Quran tells us who the Siraj is, but the answer will shock you. In Surah Al-Ahzab 33, 45, 46, we find, O Prophet, truly we have sent thee as a witness, a bearer of glad tidings and a warner, and as a lamp spreading light. Here it says that Muhammad is the lamp spreading light. In Arabic, it is wasirajan muniran. Linguistically and spiritually, this is the end of the discussion. Linguistically, Siraj and the adjective Munir are used together for the same shining thing, the person Muhammad. It's clear Munir does not mean reflected light in this verse or in any other verse. It means shining. The people of Muhammad's time understood that the moon was shining and they were right. Just as the people of Moses' time understood that the sun was the greater light and the moon the lesser light and they were right. But if you insist that the Arabic words Nur and Munir mean reflected light, then based on the use of these words in the Quran, Muhammad is like the sun and Allah is like the moon. Does Dr. Nike really want to say that Muhammad is the source of light and Allah is only his reflection? Why are these so-called scientific claims made which no Muslim can support if he makes a serious study of his own Quran? In a dialogue like tonight, it makes honest discussion very difficult, almost impossible. Let us go on and look at the water cycle. Some, Muslims and other author, some Muslim authors claim that the Quran shows pre-scientific knowledge of water cycle. What is the water cycle? Here in this slide, you see four steps. The first step is evaporation. The water evaporates from the seas and the earth. Second step, it becomes clouds. Third step, it gives rain. And fourth, this rain causes the plants to grow. This is all very straightforward. And everybody knows two, three, and four. Even if they live in a town, they know that clouds come and rain comes and their flowers grow. But what about step one, the evaporation? You can't see it. It's difficult. And the Quran does not have step one. Now we're going to look at a prophet from the Bible, a prophet from 700 BC, prophet Amos, and he writes, he who made the Pleiades and Orion, who turns black blackness into dawn and darkness darkest, darkens day into night, and then who calls off for the waters of the sea, stage one and pours them out over the face of the land, stage three. The Lord Yahweh is his name. And what, one other prophet is uh, Job. In 36, 26, 28, at least a thousand years before the Hejra, he says, how great is God beyond our understanding the number of his years is past finding out. Stage one, he draws up the drops of water, which distill from the mist as rain. That's stage three. And then the clouds are mentioned. Stage true, stage two, which pour down their moisture and abundant showers fall on mankind. So here in the Bible, this difficult stage one is there from more than a thousand years before the Koran. 